Good sure. You want to call us to work and see what we're good. We've got levels there. Get... All right. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for uh, attending the uh, California Credit Card Authority uh, board meeting today. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, call the meeting to order. Um, and um, do a roll call, please. Mark. Governor? Um, Mark Governor. State Treasurer? Judge Commissioner? Chris Schultz will be Judge Commissioner. Speaker of the Assembly? Chair Chair Sandals Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And good morning, everyone. Um, board members, uh, members of the public, uh, uh, members of the staff here, and those listening in on the web, uh, thanks for joining us. This um, additional meeting of the CA Governing Board, uh, Governing Board, <clears throat> where we have really unique opportunity today to hear from a special guest. Thank you, uh, Director Gelladish, for the use of facilities. Um, we, we are pleased to be here this morning and grateful for uh, your attendance. The the focus of uh, today's this morning's discussion is really um, informational and uh, educational and an opportunity to engage in issues that sometimes our formal board meeting uh, agenda doesn't allow us to, to get into um, uh, discussion topics such as this. <clears throat> the um, our, our, our presenter will introduce in a moment uh, indicated very happy with being very informal and entertaining questions from the board members of the public as we go through this. Uh, he will be uh, presenting on a um, really remarkable um, event, a series of events that took place in New Zealand a number of years ago and the tremendous challenges that they've been working through ever since. The earthquakes that struck Christchurch, New Zealand, both in the fall of 2010 and 2011, presented not only that country but really our comrade in arms organization, the New Zealand Earthquake Insurance Commission, with an extraordinary series of challenges. and. Um, we will benefit from, we have been benefiting from, and we will benefit today from hearing from the first-hand accounts of how they've been dealing uh, with those challenges. The uh, first uh, of the two major events that struck Christchurch was in, I think, August of 2010, September. Um, and uh, it was a couple months after that that a few of us had an opportunity to travel to New Zealand, be hosted for an incredibly educational week by, by Dr. Cohen, our, our guest today, and others of the uh, Earthquake Commission, uh, to get an in-depth look at how this organization was gearing up to respond to, to this massive earthquake, or for the, 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 this earthquake that produced massive damages. Um, I've just included here just a couple screenshots, that uh, uh, a couple photos that I took, uh, while we were there uh, in November uh, of that year, showing a home badly damaged. Um, Grant, I put up the picture of the coffee club for you. That was owned by the sister of a woman who worked in the treasurer's office. And um, and uh, uh, he told us to look her up when we were there, and we had a cup of coffee at that, at, uh, at that place in the downtown business district. That business was destroyed in an earthquake that, that would come a couple months later. And. Um, on the bottom, you see Tim engaging in, the, the mayor invited us uh, on our last evening there, invited us to attend a town hall meeting, uh, a series of meetings such as which were taking place throughout a uh, several month period of time as, as uh, the officials were gaining input from the affected homeowners and, and, uh, and people concerned about the, the, how the recovery was gonna take place. <clears throat> and uh, this was just a, a subgroup that was gaining input and they put all the input together and, and, and uh, better informed uh, themselves in terms of the pulse of the, how the community was feeling. The mayor, and that, as that town hall meeting was winding down, uh, invited me to say a few words to the hundred or so that were in attendance. And in introducing me to them, uh, these citizens of Christchurch, who you know, most of whom had homes that had been badly damaged, uh, um, but who did have financial protection as a result of the program that, that uh, Dr. Cohn will be describing. The mayor introducing me indicated that we came from the state of California, the home of this uh, similar earthquake risk, but at a place in which only 10% of the 
residents have their homes protected by earthquake insurance, and, and there was an audible collective gasp in the room, and I'll never forget it. As people there tried to just imagine for a moment what their life would have been like had they not had um, earthquake protection in place to deal with the challenges they were facing. So there was a very impactful trip for, I know, Danny and Tim and I and, and a couple other colleagues who have had a chance to engage in similar opportunities later. Um, and our intent here today, our hope is to, is to help you sort of uh, gain a first-time insight in terms of the, the challenges they've experienced and the, the ways in which um, they've been dealing with it. The New, New Zealand Earthquake Commission really is our closest counterpart in the world. Um, similar in some respects, different in, in many others, and, and those similarities and differences will be uh, described to you by our guest, uh, Dr. Hugh Cohen, a, um, a PhD who's, who's studied and, and worked around the world in the field of um, uh, uh, Earthquake science, his bio is, is uh, before you. He has asked me not to uh, embarrass him by reading it all, so I won't. I won't. Um, but um, and suffice it to say that uh, you were very gracious, uh, very grateful for your time. He's uh, day one of a long global trip. He arrived in San Francisco yesterday, uh, got up to uh, Sacramento last night, and uh, his body clock is. Not quite on our time zone, but, but he was um, uh, very happy to be a part of this uh, presentation this morning. So with that, let me just uh, turn it over to you uh, and, uh, and invite all of us to, to listen and participate and ask whatever questions come to mind when, he's, when he is through with his presentation. We've got a couple uh, questions from our individual perspectives of, of uh, communications and, uh, and mitigation and uh, risk transfer that we might ask by way of sort of uh, opening it up to a broader question answer period, but, but throughout the time and then after, um, absolutely welcome uh, all your questions. So with that, um, Hugh, the uh, floor is yours. Uh, welcome to that, please, Dr. Hugh Cohen. Thank you very much, Glenn. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Dr. Lelucci, Chris Schultz, and Brown Morgan for the board and for all uh, others who come along today. Perhaps uh, I um, will have an opportunity to meet and speak with you um, at, the, at the conclusion of the meeting. Um, as Grant described, we have been on, uh, on quite a journey over the last few years since the onset of uh, <coughs> an earthquake sequence in the southern part of New Zealand in September 2010. And over a 14 month period, we experienced uh, more than 10,000 um, aftershocks, some of which were large enough to produce significant additional damage. Indeed, the losses that Glenn witnessed with his team in uh, November 2010 were, uh, were compounded and exceeded by the earthquakes that followed in 2011, uh, in which there was significant loss of life, and, uh, and for which uh, we're also grateful to acknowledge, looking back, the support that we received from many um, international uh, teams, including um, uh, an urban search and rescue team from uh, California, uh, from Los Angeles, and uh, we are now well into what we might call the reconstruction phase. Um, that's a, a period of recovery or uh, sort of. Uh, reinstatement that's probably going to span the rest about 15 to 20 years. Um, but here in our fifth year of, um, of recovery following those losses, uh, I thought I would share with you, first of all, a, uh, a reflective um, series of images from the, the earthquakes themselves, um, the, the post-loss environment, and then move on in the second part of the presentation to talk about the, uh, the recovery itself what our role, uh, what the role of my organization is, um, and indeed uh, complementarity, or the uh, complementarity of, of uh, roles among a whole range of private and public uh, sector organizations, and then uh, touch on some of the lessons learned uh, that will play through into uh, further legislative or uh, commercial <coughs> and, uh, hopefully prepare our community for um, for whatever the next event might be, which certainly won't look like the last one. So, just 
moving into the into what I think is a, is a bit of a recap of um, the earthquake experience. I thought we'd share this because on the on the uh, the eve of um, this earthquake sequence, we were dealing with a community that, perhaps not unlike yours, had little personal experience of loss associated with uh, uh, natural perils. Uh, yes, we had experienced local events, uh, events affecting uh, small parts of, uh, of our communities, um, but it was 70 years since the previous significant uh, loss in an urban centre. So, our community was not particularly well uh, attuned to the complexities that would arise from a major urban earthquake. And I think uh, it's uh, even now, um, five, four and a half, five years into the recovery, those, those uh, acute uh, memories or experiences um, are, are beginning to fade uh, in our community. And in the anticipation of some future loss, um, it's worth, wherever you are, just reminding oneself of what actually is involved. And obviously, the, the, uh, in this case, the natural peril is earthquake, and, and we, as in California, um, experience from time to time damaging, damaging quakes associated with movement on, um, on various breaks in the Earth's crust. This is Pointer. Um, Let's go back. Never mind. I think we'll leave it to your mind's eye um, to to see how the how the, the road that once was uh, was straight across the, the Canterbury Plains, not unlike the terrain around here, uh, you can see has uh, has shifted horizontally. That was the event that uh, Glenn was describing. Occurred in early 2010. That caused very extensive liquefaction uh, where saturated soils lose their strength, um, and with the water pressures involved, large volumes of sediment come out of the surface, um, and structures built on those soils um, in some cases was, were, were very badly affected. They settled the foundations, settled unevenly, the floors. Um, stress and strain, and, uh, and of course uh, you can see it's, a, it's uh, quite a mess to clean up. Um, in this case a, a gas station or an um, underground tank that has floated to the surface as a result of the, uh, the liquefaction. Um, this was the most spectacular or catastrophic experience of liquefaction in an urban setting uh, that we can see worldwide since the Niigata earthquake in Japan in 1964. So again, you know, thinking about that 50 year period in which uh, uh, while the science of earthquake risk and the, um, you know, the, the uh, risk financing arrangements and the insurance markets all matured, uh, here was an event whose attributes uh, presented some truly unique challenges in terms of the, uh, of the recovery. Again, in an urban setting, you're dealing with uh, you know, high concentration of people. In the case of the September earthquake, it happened in the early hours of the morning. There was no loss of life, although there was extensive property damage. But the, the earthquake that occurred in uh, February of the following year um, could not have occurred in a worse place at a worse time. It was the busy, busiest time of Day, the middle of, middle of a working day, uh, the central city was full of, uh, uh, full of workers, shoppers, travelers, and the earthquake was centered um, almost directly beneath the city. The losses were very significant, um, both to older unreinforced masonry uh, buildings constructed in the 19th century by the, the early settlers, as well as a number of new or newer A lot of facades, a lot of parapets, um, you know, a lot of what you might call non-structural uh, damage that compounded the difficulties that the community faced in extracting itself from um, 
from the central business district and of course um, in many cases preventing the, the um, reoccupation of, of those businesses. The impacts in the, in the residential environment in the suburban setting um, where our structures are very similar in many respects to California, uh, you know, like clad, timber clad, timber frame dwellings with uh, uh, you know, concrete perimeter, <coughs> um, foundations of piles. Uh, the ground motions were strong enough in some areas to, uh, to see many homes lose their, uh, lose their cladding. I mentioned the ground effects where large sections of soft soil spread towards waterways or down the slope, literally tearing uh, homes apart in such affected areas. And, and on the hill suburbs around Christchurch where the homes are built on rock, essentially on a good strong foundation, the local amplification of the shaking was so great that uh, um, many both the contents of homes and many of their roofs, um, or the homes themselves, were lifted off their foundations. Accelerations, uh, which is the, you know, the way that scientists, seismologists, and engineers uh, measure ground motion, exceeded uh, gravity by uh, a factor of two in some cases, literally becoming airborne. Many buildings that did not collapse, of course, posed a very significant risk to, to life and, uh, and of course have subsequently been brought down. Um, I think the relevance of many of these images to your communities is, is um, uh, evident enough in the sense that much of the development that we have seen in Christchurch spans the last 160, 170 years. It's a comparable period of, of, um, uh, of construction practice and design. Here, where uh, folk were clearly lucky to get out, indeed um, did so to the last uh, to the last occupant. But um, this building was clearly not in good shape. And I mentioned loss of life, and there were 185, 186 lives were lost, um, most in the collapse of two commercial buildings. Uh, this was one of them, a 1960s uh, reinforced concrete frame building. There were other large modern buildings that did not collapse, but uh, the damage was such that they posed a threat to the surrounding commercial district, and um, we were presented with unique challenges associated with uh, contingent business interruption business continuity where uh, a home uh, or a, a business might not have suffered any, any material loss directly as a result of the earthquake, um, but as a result of uh, damage to neighboring structures, and particularly uh, tall ones such as this, entire blocks uh, remained off limits for months. Um, people were not even able to recover their, their, uh, their files, their furniture, uh, their computer systems, etc. So there were, there were compounding uh, factors that, um, that really introduced a lot of complexity into the, into the recovery. Uh, an example of a, a large commercial building that achieved what engineers might term good performance. It was technically repairable in terms of the, the, uh, the cracking that it experienced. It, uh, it yielded in all the right places, as it were, to preserve life safety. But in the wake of the loss, the, the appetite of the community um, to reoccupy multi-story buildings was, um, uh, was so seriously affected, reduced. Um, and within months, buildings such as this were surrounded by open ground where all other buildings had been removed. So economically and socially, there was an imperative to demolish and rebuild rather than repair. And come back to it later, but it was at this point that we discovered, uh, as did many of the private insurance companies, the complexities that arise from policy terms and conditions. When you're trying to, when you're trying to assess the 
residual capacity or the future performance of a building that has been through a serious earthquake and is potentially repairable. But at what point does a building that has experienced such an event, uh, at what point is it no longer as new? In terms of the insurance response, tremendous amount of complexity uh, arising from unique attributes of the loss and the, <coughs> the challenge of reconciling uh, policies and, mm -hmm. and societal expectations with, uh, with those uh, attributes. Demolition, of course, was the very... Uh, there are still a number, even five years, four and a half, five years on, there are still a number of buildings that have yet to be demolished. The ground performance in those areas where the water table was close to the surface um, was a unique, if, if not defining, feature of these, uh, of these events. And of course, for all the damage that occurred above ground, you can imagine what was happening to the pipes, to the wastewater, the water, bridge structures, wharf structures. Uh, levees, railways. And here's just a, uh, a, a comparison um, of an image on the top left uh, which I took from an Air Force helicopter in um, the day, days immediately following the February earthquake, looking back into the central business district. And here's a, a similar image um, with, with one structure uh, remaining and, and linked there for, for, um, for context. And you can see that was about uh, 12 months, yes, almost exactly 12 months, uh, 15 months later. Um, the amount of open ground, the amount of the central business district that had already been demolished. Same photo taken, the same image taken today would show even more open ground, but it would also show the appearance of cranes and other uh, heavy equipment associated with the region, which is now getting underway, um, starting with some of the publicly funded anchor projects around justice, education, um, and we anticipate in the next uh, few years uh, that will extend to a private sector investment, renewed investment on the back of insurance settlements. So hopefully that quick trawl through some of the images from those earthquakes will help shape the context for, um, for the balance of uh, discussion today in which I really like to to share some of the um, you know, some, some of the contextual background to uh, who uh, we are what the earthquake commission does how we uh, in the face of the private market uh, what our role is in both delivering outcomes for uh, social policy and political economy as well as uh, underpinning the risk financing arrangements for, for New Zealand. So there's just a bit of narrative uh, to describe where we are. We're like California, we're on the on a major plate boundary. We, we live on the front line, as it were. We experience seismic events all the time. Um, the challenge for us is that in terms of managing the risk is that the um, the market for geological hazards in New Zealand is um, <coughs> delivers very imperfect signals. It's a it's a um, it's a very volatile environment in which to try to price risk because we have very few centres of population. So earthquakes, the outcome of an earthquake is binary. It's either zero because the earthquake is out in the middle of nowhere and there are just sheep and cows and national parks um, affected, or every <laughs> now and again it, it strikes an urban centre. And if it's one of our larger urban centres 
then we're looking at a significant fraction of our gross domestic product um, at risk. So we've, we've got that volatility that we have to manage, and as net importers of capital, small population, less than five million, we, we have to not only understand what it is we're living with, we need to understand the cost at which we can transfer some component of that uh, in order to, um, to have a sustainable, uh, sustainable basis for, um, uh, you know, for, for, managing, for managing our, um, our risk exposure. So we've found over the years that uh, a mixed private-public approach has served us well, and these recent earthquakes are the most significant in the history of our organization, which um, began at the end of the Second World War, which was also a period, a period um, in which New Zealand communities had been affected by a series of natural disasters from the late 1920s to the early 1940s. Different parts of New Zealand were, were struck repeatedly by shallow destructive earthquakes. And it coincided with a period of economic depression, global depression, and the World War, which we were involved in also. And our parliament, a government at the time, was conscious of the level of underinsurance in our communities and, and the lack of access to affordable capital for reconstruction. There were some communities which many years after the, their particular earthquake had not been able to rebuild. So at the end of the Second World War, the Earthquake Commission was established uh, and it entailed the introduction of a, uh, a levy on fire insurance premiums such that when any homeowner purchased a fire policy, they would automatically receive the Earthquake Commission cover and they would compulsorily acquire it. So the solidarity principle, which was easy enough to introduce at that time, uh, might be difficult today, um, but it was a flat-rated premium and it allowed a fund to be established and with one or two other um, provisions set out to ensure that in the event of natural disaster, earthquake, volcanic eruption, tsunami, landslip, hydrothermal activity, or fire following any of those perils, that the citizens would receive enough of an entitlement, insurance entitlement, to be able to get back into a modest home. So it's a first loss scheme. It's a, we're a first loss um, insurer. And we, so we're providing basic cover, ground up for the dwelling and a modest contribution for the contents. And through this arrangement, we're effectively providing a deductible for the private market. We come in on top, providing affordable top-up cover to ensure that our homeowners are effectively insured for these natural perils. We have our scheme operating only in the residential market. So <clears throat> we insure the first $100,000 of a dwelling loss and the first $20,000 of loss to contents. And we have, we also have uh, uh, protection for, for land under rather complex uh, rules, but nevertheless, this this uh, $120,000 deductible has allowed the private market to offer top-up cover on a voluntary basis um, that has ensured we enjoy 90% market penetration. And I think from Glenn's comments earlier, you, you, you experience around 10%, 10-11% We probably have one of the highest uh, penetration rates worldwide. I think maybe only the Netherlands um, exceeds uh, our cover with 5% of our housing stock um, provided through social housing, which is self-insured. We, we believe we only have about 5% of homeowners uninsured. So that's a, that's a significant um, uh, level of protection. 
non-residential property, um, commercial property infrastructure that is entirely with the private market, or in the case of public infrastructure, uh, in some cases it is insured, but in some cases it's self-insured. which way I should be pointing this. It's frozen. Yeah. I put it to sleep. <laughs> I just use the arrows here. That's fine. Okay, so I described the loss of life with the with the Canary earthquakes. Um, that was probably the that was probably the defining, uh, the defining moment of um, in which public awareness of our experience of earthquake changed. With the September 2010 earthquake, although it was a larger earthquake, um, because no lives were lost, there was, a, there was a sense in which we dodged a bullet and we'd done very well. Most of the losses were associated with the older, unreinforced masonry. And then these locally, uh, these local effects involving soft soil and nuclear action. With the collapse of two major commercial buildings and the loss of life, uh, it took on a completely different direction. Um, and it drove the economic losses uh, up from, well, by uh, probably more than 50%. Um, those economic losses are now estimated at around 40 billion New Zealand dollars, which I guess is around 30 billion US on, on current exchange. It's, um, it's, a, it's a significant uh, loss, and because of the high level of insurance protections in New Zealand, uh, the insurance participation was something like 80%, 80% of the losses from these events. So the, uh, the town perhaps fewer than 350,000 managed to generate a loss that was globally significant. Um, and of course, in a year in which the insurance markets had to deal with uh, high floods, and tsunami, bushfires, and floods in Australia, and of course, earlier in that so we were chilling. We, we received 750,000 That is, any household can claim for damage to their building, its contents, or the land. Um, so this this uh, took our uh, our experience of um, operating the scheme from uh, one in which our previous experience did not exceed um, six to ten thousand homes. All of a sudden, we were dealing with three four. The, um, the liability, uh, our share of the liability is around 11 and a half billion New Zealand. Roughly 8, 8 billion US. And you can see there the breakdown <coughs> of, the, uh, of the claims. Um, the most significant component of, um, of our response, however, for us was that unlike historically where we had cash setting on it, the government directed us to organize a managed repair program to ensure that the reconstruction capital would be used, would be deployed to reinstate damaged buildings. And they did that for, uh, for several reasons. One was to manage inflation small and tight labor market. We, we used to say that an earthquake in California occurs in ocean resources. An earthquake in New Zealand occurs in ocean. We were looking at having to <coughs> significantly scale up our 
our slots to meet the demands of such a recovery. And we believe that had we cash settled, we would merely have fueled inflation. We would also have uh, introduced a lot of uncertainty in the property market regarding the future the status of those uh, repairs. We wanted to avoid a two tier market emerging involving pre and post earthquake construction, um, given the risk that insurance companies might be used to protect the cosmetic repair, leaving Discovered at some time in the future. The other thing that was uh, fortuitous about the, the government's direction to establish such a program was that we had scaled up and had the contract resources in place at the time of the February 2011 earthquake. We immediately redeployed those contractors from substantial earthquake repairs to delivery of emergency repairs to keep the population in place to avoid having to take <coughs> place of effort. So the focus there was to ensure that homes were safe, sanitary, and secure, and to ensure that every home had at least one source of heating reinstated before the onset of the disaster, which can be Fifty thousand, more than fifty thousand emergency repairs were, were carried out over the following year, a period during which the earth continued to, to move and experienced multiple aftershocks. So that was something we had never done before. Um, we knew that it would be challenging, um, but we are now at a point where we have um, completed six just over 65,000 repairs of a total uh, that's estimated to the top out of our city. So we're really proud So how well were we prepared for this, at least in terms of the, the scope of, of scenario planning? Um, you know, I think one lesson that's worth sharing is that uh, an adaptive response is an adaptive response is what you need to be able to, to deliver and for that you do need to plan, but the plan itself uh, may bear very little resemblance to, to the reality. We there you can see in terms of the scale of losses, the largest historical events uh, in Angakura 1968, Gisborne 2007, were really inconsequential compared to <coughs> those that we witnessed in 2010-2011. Um, uh, we commissioned in 2009 a review, an independent review of our catastrophe response arrangements. Um, we brought in uh, uh, people uh, with international experience in logistics management, uh, defense, and, um, natural travel response. Um, they're a very competent panel. And they assessed that we should be planning for response a major event at the level of about 80,000 claims. And they were comfortable with our uh, expectation of 150,000 claims for our probable massive loss, um, which would be a percent of our capital in uh, Wellington. What we experienced was, as you heard in the slide, something different and much larger. In financial terms, though, the Canterbury losses, our liability, is comparable to our probable maximum loss for Wellington at about the 90th percentile. So if you think about how you're modeling your potential financial exposure, um, we all understand that we tend to work with means and mediums. This type of peril that we face is very rare, high consequence events. Um, you really need to be thinking about what's happening out of the tail of the distribution. How bad could it possibly be? What is it that we really might be uh, having to have And we were certainly very thankful to find that for 
exponentially based on the macro level. We have the resources that we need to meet that, to meet that demand, but we only have it because of the insurance. The other thing that we've discovered that's of tremendous, has been of tremendous value is our ability to um, leverage a range of data and information in order to inform the recovery. Uh, we have a mandate, which I'll touch on shortly, uh, a statutory mandate to facilitate research and innovation so that in the quiet times between these catastrophic events, we can build New Zealand's understanding of the risks that it faces uh, and incrementally over time adjust its exposure to those risks. So we, when these earthquakes occurred, we had mature relationships and arrangements in place with science and engineering community, uh, both in our private and public sector. And we've made extensive use of um, modern, you know, modern technologies, um, spatial mapping tools, um, etc., in order to acquire an evidence-based understanding of the losses. And of course, we're using those to inform um, our insurance liabilities, and we're using those to assist others. Um, to ensure that as we or others reach a determination around insurance entitlements, that we can offer a transparent and evidence-based uh, framework for, for uh, explanation of uh, how we are reaching those decisions. A lot of what we do in between the events is focused on trying to build decisions research, public education is equally important in terms of building and maintaining public awareness, and particularly in the periods between events. Prior to these losses, the New Zealand community was probably about as aware as maybe the California community in recent years. Um, we're all human, we all, we, we, our, our memories uh, very much geared or our priorities are very much set by the issues of the day. I think in your community here, you're coming to terms with the implications of uh, emerging drought crisis. Um, but I think California has known that water is a precious resource uh, at least for many years. But something must have been happening recently that has taken that to the front page of the final lines reading yesterday. And the end. Well, for us, it's the same. Earthquakes, it's tomorrow's problem. Droughts are going to be tomorrow's problem until they emerge. But through our public education program, we're also building awareness of the role of insurance. It's, it's a contribution to the, the financial literacy of the community. Um, in our community, most folk have their homes which constitute their most uh, valuable asset. Have a high level of insurance protection, but we need to maintain that. And you know, in the absence of a loss, many people um, naturally question why they pay certain taxes, why they you know, grudge purchase, grudge purchase on the back of grudge purchase in our case. But um, in the wake of these losses, people in our community are renewed since. Through our research program, we've made in the last two decades some quite old investments. Um, old in the sense that our, the, the, the envelope for research and education is not <coughs> tied uh, in a narrow sense to residential housing. It's not tied to, it's not related to our, explicitly to our, our, uh, our understanding although we leverage our research gains for those things. It's, at heart, the, the various boards of our commission have, over the years, sought to position uh, EQC's investment in such a way that would build the overall societal uh, readiness and awareness. 
this GeoNet is a national hazard monitoring system. It's, a, it's an integrated system that monitors earth deformation, seismic vibrations, monitoring data, active volcanoes, something that kind of volcanoes don't have to worry about, um, and tsunami detection, uh, which we share with us. We um, the gains that we have realized through the investment in GeoNet have, GeoNet have been. Uh, really quite incredible. We've, um, and even within the context of the Canterbury earthquakes, we have more quantitative observations of how the buildings were started, how the ground was formed, um, than, well, than, than most other jurisdictions. Um, and those observations, rather than merely informing Academic understanding and scientific interest in earthquake phenomena are right at the heart of our ability and so the ability of others to quantify the performance of buildings to inform the revision, the revision of um, design and construction practice and indeed uh, to inform an assessment of insurance liabilities and for the public themselves to understand what was going on with the earth movement the The demand for public information um, has been growing almost exponentially since, since that, that period. And uh, for those of you interested in, in uh, understanding the, the, the local refinements that we've made, all of this, of course, is accessible on, on the web. Uh, the popularity of our, our apps and web presence has allowed us to reach out to the community in, in new ways. So it's not just people who are interested in, uh, in science or earthquakes or uh, uh, the Discovery Channel, um, etc. We're finding that these connections that we have us to have far broader conversations about risk um, at a personal level, risk at a community level, um, through into insurance, risk financing, and reconstruction. So that's pretty well, yes, I think the um, at the macro level, these conversations, of course, um, play round into our engagement with the international capital markets and, the markets. and uh, they help us to provide a more transparent understanding or view of New Zealand risk. We're finding that it's equally important for us to explain to our own communities how we are managing that risk. Uh, Glenn mentioned that I'm at the beginning of a, a much longer trip it's true, I began um, the insurance negotiations for the placement of our program um, in New York early next week. The trip will take me out to Europe, um, back to Asia. Um, the reinsurance markets have made a unique and vital contribution to our recovery. Um, on our program alone, we, our reinsurance collections will be around $4.5 billion, um, to which we Six billion through our own funding uh, scheme, our, our natural disaster fund, and our continuing access to those markets is a tribute, or first of all, to the maturity of those markets and understanding the role that they play in societal reconstruction. But it also reflects the confidence that they have in, uh, in our approach to characterising the risks um, and the transparency that we. That, that brings us back into a conversation in our own communities about how we should be managing the trade-offs in the treatment of this. We can't afford to transfer, transfer it all. We can't afford to mitigate it all. Um, but we are, I think we are having now a more holistic, a more uh, practical and honest conversation about 
how we can manage this exposure over a long period of time. Those who have incurred the loss may not be those who Generation, we have to be thinking beyond what happens with me today to what happens with you and others. So, thanks very much. I hope I haven't opened up your time. Thank you. <laughs>
you're dealing with both material, financial, and uh, the social needs, um, health, mental health, etc. Um, and uh, the challenge, uh, challenge, and many of the lessons learned, of course, arise from um, the, uh, the the unfamiliarity of um, uh, the requirements for yeah, interaction and coordination among those. Given uh, how that earthquake early warning program, or are you considering implementation of one? Well, the, our geonet monitoring system is, um, uh, is, a, is a modern, is a system that, um, that would provide the, the underpinnings for any such early warning. Tsunami early, early detection and warning of tsunami is the most compelling uh, case uh, that. Um, that we have for early warning um, of that and volcano surveillance. So uh, we we are all already organised in such a way as to provide um, you know, the aviation sector with uh, warnings of ashkoon dangers and, and this kind of thing. The problem with earthquake early warning is that it's only effective if the earthquake source is um, is at some distance from you know the communities at risk. And in many in many cases uh, we we sit right on top of them. So uh, that rather limits the uh, you know, the scope um, for, for earthquake early warning. But certainly, uh, um, we're big on an investment in, in the underpinning science um, and its connection to um, social application and, and public awareness. So, thank you so much for being here. It's really interesting. And one of the things, one observation, two questions, but something that I find very interesting is every disaster is an opportunity for learning and so we haven't, since this organization has been in existence, there haven't been the same learning opportunities that Canterbury Quakes give you, but you know, just your observations about how long the recovery is going to take. I was pretty conservative modeling in terms of claims turned out to be. You know, and that's interesting and good for us to, to hear. Um, a couple of questions that I have. Since the California Earthquake Authority has been one of the questions that they get quite a bit is will they be strong enough to survive after a big event? And I think we've answered that question pretty Obviously, you um, see is still in existence. So I'd be curious to know is that a question that you've thought of over, it, over time and how many steps do you take to make sure you're financially sound to? Day out during a big claims event like this. And then the other one is just our perennial question that we try to tackle, or look at, or understand is the take up rate in California. And I just wondered if you had insights. Is there something in the history to um, insurance is voluntary in New Zealand? But you know, if you have any insights into why your take up rate is so significantly higher than this. Okay. Um, first question. Um, solvency. Um, we are technically insolvent. Um, if we were an insurance company, we would be technically insolvent. Because um, on an incurred basis, our fund is fully allocated to the Canterbury losses, um, with a shortfall of possibly half a billion dollars. Um, which the for which the the reinsurance, the available reinsurance will not be sufficient. Why is this not a, an issue um, for us? Well, we, we also enjoy uh, a government guarantee. So standing behind EQC in, in terms of, of the legislation under which we operate is a, a government guarantee <coughs> to meet our liabilities. Um, for this reason, we are we're able to we have always been able to um, to organise the scheme um, and offer a level of protection, um, which is helpful not only to the homeowner but to the um, continuing viability of the private market. Um, that uh, you know, I guess, in some sense, is, is unique. So we we are still we still exist and we expect to, um, to continue to exist because we enjoy that, uh, that financial backstop. Now, um, 
this is the first time in our history that we have come anywhere close to possibly calling on that guarantee. We may, it may be touch and go, based in mind that, sorry, bearing in mind that um, our expectations are currently informed by an actuarial forecast, not, um, not um, the, uh, the claims development as such. But that is clearly an important component of our, of our uh, uh, sustainability. In terms of take-up rate, um, although <clears throat> two things. One is, in New Zealand, for most folk, their home is their, is their major asset. And you know, I think culturally uh, speaking, whether or not there's any bank lending involved, we have always had, um, we've, we've always had a strong insurance culture. But having said that, uh, if you buy a private fire policy from any provider, and that is entirely um, free choice, uh, you will compulsorily receive our cover. We don't issue policies. Um, we provide cover in the form of a levy on private policies. So we have to take your risk and you have to take our cover. Uh, it's flat rated um, and for that reason it is affordable. Some would say it's too affordable. Um, and one of the reforms of our act or our legislation that we anticipate over the next year or two, we will be looking to adjust um, the structure of the scheme, but we will be doing so with, a, with, 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 a cl with close attention to the impact of such reform on the underlying policy. So future affordability or insurability and the affordability of insurance is, is, a, is, a, is an objective of uh, terms of political economy. We, we are an instrument of social policy using the insurance model. We are very business-like, but we are not for business. And yet the private market um, would be unlikely to offer affordable cover were it not for the $120,000 deductible that we provide in the form of our first loss protection. So really, it's that it's the compulsion <coughs> on uh, with the scheme um, and its universal application, and the fact that that facilitates it's priced at a level that facilitates um, widespread uptake of insurance. And I think just one note to, to maybe finish my point on is that from a government perspective, the government understands of course that in the absence of such a scheme, uh, it would be brought into play through, through welfare and emergency um, you know, funding arrangements. The beauty of the scheme, the, the Earthquake Commission scheme, is that it allows the government to define or to impose some discipline on the, the context and extent to which its liabilities will, <coughs> will um, take shape in the wake of, uh, of, a, of a major loss. Um, the government expects that in the absence of such a scheme, uh, it would be expected to provide such relief, but it would be unmodeled and, uh, and possibly um, a lot more difficult to manage in terms of expectations. Maybe just a quick follow-up on that, if I could. So the, 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 so the compulsory, the mandatory earthquake um, protection offered by the AQC, which is not a policy, but basically a, a program. Um, prior to the Christchurch event, the cost for that layer was about, remember, sort of 60 or $80 uh, yeah. a year? Yeah, yeah, around seven, seventy dollars a year. It's gone up to uh, just over two hundred. Um, so there was a threefold increase in the levy um, post uh, post loss, but uh, nothing so far has um, has happened to the caps. Uh, and the, these are the matters that the government will be considering through the treasury as uh, as we progress a review of the scheme going forward. If I could. Mr. Chair, continue. This was the area that I was uh, interested in, just a uh, little more conversation about. The, 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 um, the combination of the, the mandatory requirement that homes obtain it, the, the coupling that with the 
ultimately the, the guarantee provided by the Crown. Um, but matched alongside that, the reinsurance protection that's gained to the, the, the private sector seems like, to me, all those factors combined to, to place the community of pressures in a position where 90% of the homes were protected uh, the, the, during that horrible uh, period of time. We have, as, as um, you know, you have some more, so we've, over time, um, explored ways of, of um, diversifying our risk transfer by, by uh, obtaining some fashion of some sort of uh, maybe guarantee from the federal government, which, which politically uh, does not appear likely to happen. So we've even explored ways of providing some sort of state-based uh, layer of all protection. And the time does not appear right to be pursuing uh, any specific role in that area. Uh, we're not quite there yet, I don't think. Um, but, um, uh, but we're not giving up, and we continue to explore. My, if I can just ask you sort of generally, uh, knowing that we rely very heavily on, uh, on reinsurance, uh, the, the um, and as a result, 40% of what our policyholders pay us uh, quoted to our reinsurance spend. The, uh, could you just basically touch on the, the benefits that you see of, of, a, of a blended approach, whereby you, you retain important reinsurance uh, protection, which we always have and I believe we always will, but the benefits that you get when you are able to lay alongside that uh, a bit more risk transfer obtained in some sort of mechanism that would be uh, more broadly distributed on a posting on basis. Well, it's, um, yeah, thanks. It's a, it's a, it's a trade-off and <clears throat> effectively we are providing um, protection for the New Zealand government balance sheet. Um, and over the years we have had conversations with, uh, with, with the Treasury and private market regarding where we should sit with respect to the loss. Um, it's, it's a challenge, of course, to develop a, a truly holistic understanding of balance sheet risk. Um, I could say that our government is, interest, is more interested in, in trying to achieve this today than perhaps at any time in the past. If we're mindful of the experience of the global financial crisis, the sovereign debt crisis, um, fluctuations in the commodities and the pricing thereof, and of course in the wake of uh, natural disasters. I don't think we have any uh, magic um, uh, approach other than an understanding that by that we are trying to retain um, risk to the point where we can optimize the cost of transferring. Fraction of it. So, when our fund years ago, when our fund, natural disaster fund, was very small, we the attachment point for our insurance program was also proportionally low, much lower than uh, than it is today. So, as our fund grew, uh, we pushed, we, we purchased reinsurance further up in terms of a potential loss. Um, and since the Canterbury earthquakes, um, with the fund allocated to those losses on Incurred basis, at least, we've simply tried to buy as much insurance protection as possible. Um, we've yet to have that explicit uh, conversation with the government about the trade offs between fund size and insurance protection. Um, and I would anticipate that this will be a feature of. Um, of the review of our arrangements. But one thing is for sure, we are net importers of capital. We are always going to need to transfer a component of our risk. Mm -hmm. The question really is, um, what is what is the government, what is the community's appetite for uh, that, the level of retention? It's a judgment call and it's, and it's one that will bring a number of people Two more questions on our end, if that's all right. Uh, Chris? Two quick questions. One of your slides, I believe, showed some red dots, and I thought that the slide said that the government purchased those properties. Oh, yes. So, did I misunderstand that? No, you didn't. You didn't. I, I just didn't refer adequately to it. Um, I, I, that, this one. Yeah. Yes, that's a good point. Um, 
The worst affected areas, uh, there were about 7,000 homes, um, in areas where the liquefaction or the physical effects of the earthquakes were so severe that the government took a decision to purchase those properties or to offer uh, residents um, a way out, recognizing not only that the cost of reinstating housing and related infrastructure would be very significant, but that the time required to do it would be disproportionately long um, for those affected. And so this was really seen as a way of, of bringing resolution to, 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 to communities, um, to local communities who really lost pretty much everything, um, including their service connections. So yes, government purchased um, purchased both uh, land and dwellings and, uh, under an arrangement that actually allowed uh, the homeowners to negotiate an outcome with their private insurance company if they prefer to do that. Um, and all but a handful of those households have now moved on. Um, they've rebuilt elsewhere or they have, um, they've uh, moved into other property. One other question. Um, risk factors for different property owners. Are there areas in New Zealand with zero risk factor, but they're still subject to the, the 70 or $100 a year? How is that handled? How does that work out kind of politically in your environment? Right, so, um, yeah, so our, our, our levy is a, the, the, the tax on private fire policies for our program. Uh, is flat rated throughout the country. There is, given that we cover uh, a number of perils, and including fire following, um, there is probably no community in New Zealand that has zero risk. Um, given that we, e even those areas that are remote from a seismic or volcanic uh, effect, are still subject to landslip during high intensity rainstorms and so forth. So. Uh, no one has a zero risk exposure. Certainly some have a greater risk than, um, than others, but the value of the scheme, given that it is a first loss by its very nature, um, is that it, 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 it mitigates against uh, adverse selection. It, it mitigates the risk that, uh, that only people in uh, relatively low risk areas will be able to obtain cover, or conversely, that people who really need it can't get it. So, um, and of course the, the premium is rather affordable. It has it has low earthquake risk. It has some, and it has volcanic risk. Yes, yes, they are, and but of course they are. Um, they periodically experience, uh, you know, extra tropical cyclones that um, dump a lot of rain and produce uh, slope failures and so forth, and, and we identify them for, for those losses. So, our attrition losses historically have been uh, highest in naturally in, in those communities. So, flat rated. Yeah, everybody pays the same. Yes, everybody pays the same. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a Geico commercial. A what, sir? Uh, uh, it's a private insurance company here. Ads we see on TV all the time. Okay. If you could magically turn back time, in doing so, having a look at your communication strategies and techniques, preparations, prior to a big event, based on your experiences after the Christchurch event, how would those communication strategies, techniques, be? Well, they would be, they would be very different. We would know who our customers were, for example, uh, for a start. I mean, I have emphasized, I guess, in the presentation so far, those attributes of the recovery 
that I think have worked pretty well and which are of probably greatest interest to a global community, the macro risk funding. At a micro level, um, some people would characterize their experience as being uh, of their insurance company or of uh, dealing with EQC as far worse than the earthquakes themselves. Um, in some cases, because the sheer scale of the loss and the time required to deliver entitlements, to, to assess and adjust and deliver insurance payouts, um, we're dealing with a community that, that had, was experiencing a loss of control, loss of agency, as it were, for the first time ever. Um, and we were dealing with folk with whom we had no knowledge of or no prior connection to. Because we don't sell policies and the commercial providers, the private insurance companies, do not historically have not provided um, portfolio information to us prior to an event, uh, we were receiving claims from people we had no uh, awareness of, no knowledge of. Uh, and, and through claim enlargement and various other um, sort of aspects of claims handling involving the interface between the Earthquake Commission and the private market that was far from ideal. Reflecting, you know, that historical complacency um, in the absence of a loss where there was no need to interact, there was no need, very few claims historically went through the cap. So we had our private market private insurance market was um, had very little experience of dealing with earthquake losses. We had very little experience in needing to deal with large numbers of claims all at once. So what would we do differently? We would know who our customers were. We would have far better um, arrangements for the coordination of the response with the private market, uh, be that technically in terms of loss adjustment or um, or socially in terms of, um, of a, 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 a joined up approach to communications. Um, I'd add that um, we're well on the way to developing or, or maturing those arrangements, but certainly, certainly that would be one area that we would do very differently. We, we it was interesting. I thought you wanted this back. <laughs> um, well, first of all, thank you for that presentation, and, and also thank you. Uh, California homeowners have already benefited from the EQC and the, and the recovery, and then I had the privilege of spending a week there, and uh, I think my, this group certainly knows that Dr. Cohen put me in contact with um, all different aspects of the recovery, and um, was able to bring that back, and a lot of it is, is informing our mitigation program. And I'm glad this slide is up because you know data is just so key to so much of what we're doing. And as an engineer, so much of the data that we get is is really skim because it's it's fire information. I mean, we're getting it from a different industry than an engineering industry. So you have amazing data for the the soil failure in. Um, in the earthquake sequences, and that we can definitely learn from. You have your, your T2 and T3, T1, and the various levels of reinforcement of both soil and foundation that you had to do. Um, we don't have quite the, the water problem. Um, Mark is a huge water program, but, but it actually serves the earthquake community because we don't have the high water table. In terms of ground shaking, I would imagine that because you've managed the construction, you also have a lot of data on uh, how various types of houses performed in the earthquake. So do you have any plans right now to, to I know you're, you're almost there, but to kind of call through that and, and to get lessons and to get information? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, actually better than that, we're sharing that data with anyone qualified to um, you know, work with it themselves. I mean, we're doing a bunch of stuff with the data uh, for our own purposes, but um, we would never claim a monopoly of um, wisdom or insight when it comes to um, working with such information. And already now for some months we have been sharing information um, 
in aggregate, but in aggregate at a level that is detailed enough to inform a lot of different modeling applications uh, while preserving or upholding commitments under privacy legislation and so forth that um, you know, ensure that we're not uh, breaching um, um, uh, anyone's, um, <coughs> anyone's privacy. Um, that information, whether it be uh, from our um, uh, claim repair uh, portfolio or from the data that you see here, uh, is, is available um, in terms of a very simple non-disclosure agreement. So we, we've been providing this to both research institutions, reinsurance companies, um, modeling entities, um, you know, so some of the, the, the producers of the vendor models, the cat loss models, and, uh, and if it would be of interest to you or others in this community, we're only too happy to, to share. And we do so through our mandate um, to facilitate research and education. It's part of that broader mandate. One. Thanks, you for the presentation. Um, very good job. Let me ask you a question about the legal setting uh, in New Zealand system and a little bit of comparison. Um, here in this country, recovery from natural disasters uh, extends over a substantial period. Um, of course, getting help to the victims is very important, short term, long term, etc. But it's very common that there are protracted and extremely expensive steps where participants and the victims deal with the legal uh, ramifications of the events. The victims are often legally represented. Uh, they may be litigating insurance companies or governments. Insurance companies themselves, even reinsurance companies, um, are involved in wrangling over you know, who has to pay and when and what to what, what kind of peril is it, how, how does the insurance respond, if at all. Um, we really heard from you that the Christchurch earthquake sequence took New Zealand society far beyond the stories of just individuals. Uh, it really was uh, a question of, is Canterbury a place to live anymore? Uh, what, are, what are society's hopes and fears about being in that place? Uh, continuing earthquakes over a period of 15, 16 months, uh, continuing to cause damage, certainly contributed to that. In your view, how, how has New Zealand's legal system and the actions of the various participants in the recovery influence the Christchurch recovery. Um, and related to that, are there any changes in the legal system that you think might be advisable thinking about how the EQC and the government might approach the next Christchurch? Question. Um, I think the <laughs> question as to whether um, there might be refinements <coughs> on, well, to the legal system or to, um, or to the way in which uh, recovery, parties to the recovery coordinate. I'm sure these things will be addressed in, indeed they are being addressed through a number of reviews that are underway with regard to performance of buildings in case of um, the inquiries that followed the commercial building collapses um, and the implications for um, mitigation practices under, under the Building Act. I think there are questions perhaps as to how we channel liability um, in the context of business as usual. Um, liability, I think, in most jurisdictions is channeled to, in, in terms of consumer protections, is, is channeled to economic agents and and own branders and producers uh, who are expected to warrant the performance of their good or their service. And I think that works pretty well for vacuum cleaners and washing machines um, and TVs. Uh, it doesn't necessarily work so well for a foundation um, that takes into account variations in soil, natural soil from one side of a lot to another. Uh, and what we are seeing is a degree of conservatism being um, it's the inverse form of pass the parcel. When uh, music stops, you find that somebody's put an extra wrap on it rather than uh, taking the wrap off. So, I mean, that's perhaps a nice problem to have. Um, 
you know, I think that in our community, it's it's not so much uh, changes that would enhance protections as changes that might help optimize or improve the evidence base for um, for legal determination. I'd have to say our experience of dealing with the courts has been, in, in the context of insurance, um, our insurance liability has been very positive. We have approached the courts twice during the, the, um, the recovery, approached the courts with the Insurance Council of New Zealand in order to seek declaratory judgments, uh, judicial ruling on how certain provisions of our legislation might be best interpreted to bring clarity to, um, you know, to the outcome rather than contention. Yeah, the council is the, the organization that represents the private market. Um, all those licensed um, um, under prudential rules for the <coughs> to, to provide service in, in the New Zealand community. So we, we approached the, uh, the courts for, uh, for a ruling on the reinstatement provisions of our policy. Um, we've approached them again more recently for a ruling on um, on some aspects of our uh, of our legislation that concerns the uh, that defines damage to land and, and how our insurance liability related to such provisions might be applied and trans translated into a settlement pathway. In both cases, the courts have provided clarity and. Um, and have facilitated recovery rather than impeding it. So I can't really, uh, I can't really, I can't think of any any dimension to the to to, to the recovery experience in which uh, legal issues have been a problem. I mentioned earlier with respect to um, the performance of buildings, the difficulty that we and and and, and actually in particular the private market. Um, have in reconciling policy terms and conditions with the attribute, with the physical attributes of a loss. You know, how many cycles of motion does a building go through before it is no longer as new? Um, there have been a number of buildings um, written off or, or um, judged to be, you know, total losses um, on the basis that folk are unwilling to accept that their performance could be assured in the future. So. I think there's, uh, as we go back into the modelling of risk and managing of expectations, I think um, there will be greater attention paid in, in underwriting to the wording of policies. Um, not to sharpen up the exclusions, uh, but simply to, um, to deal with the complexities and the confusion that arises when uh, um, when, when language is um, is simply too general. Sure, um, if you don't mind, uh, on your behalf, uh, as we move to wrap up, it would now be a time to ask members of the public if there are any questions or comments. Okay, well, one more question, which, is, which percentage of, uh, of those, uh, private policies on top of the UC cover? Oh, all of them. I think they, forgive me if I misunderstood. I thought the, the, the EQC cover ran with the fire policy, but they could buy additional earthquake coverage. That's so. So generally speaking, um, uh, private carriers offer natural disaster protection, uh, excess of the EQC protection. In other words, they will exclude it below our cap, and um, and and, and offer, will offer it um, above the cap. So it, it is a well, I'm calling it a fire policy, but in fact, it is. It's a. Um, it's effectively all risks. Thank you. Anything else from the board? Any questions from any of the audience? Yeah, I'd just like to follow up. Thank you. I'd just like to follow up on that last response. So to clarify. For a homeowner, you will have earthquake coverage up to the limit that you purchase in all instances? Yes, you, um, if I understood your question correctly, you will have uh, a typical homeowner will have the EQC cover up to the EQC limit, and above that limit will have um, 
additional cover through the through the private through the private market. Now, at the time of the Canterbury losses, most homeowners in New Zealand enjoyed the benefit of or the privilege of open-ended replacement policies, new for old. Since the losses, the New Zealand insurance market has moved um, almost all policyholders to some insured policies. Uh, it is still possible to get full replacement through um, a couple of carriers um, who have a, a, um, um, a unique footprint in our community, but the, um, the majority of, uh, of policyholders, homeowner policy, policies now are some insured, can be some insured. Then just one, one quick follow-up question. What happened to the cost of the earthquake coverage in the private sector after the losses? Uh, it went up, as do now on its own, um, reflecting also the increase in the wholesale market. But it is still uh, affordable. Any other Hello, and thank you for that great presentation. It's been fascinating. Um, I am curious, I believe one of the earlier slides mentioned that private insurance is, is the coverage that's available for non-residential buildings in New Zealand, that the non-residential buildings are not under the coverage of umbrella coverage of EQC. Have you found in the aftermath of Christchurch that they had sufficient coverage, and in the instances where you were discussing the fact that people did not want to return to some of those buildings for fear that they weren't quite sufficiently repaired, um, did the government choose to become involved in any of that demolition or purchasing of those properties? Or how, how do you see that playing out in the future in terms of such a catastrophic loss in the business sector that does have ripple effects into the um, right, so um, you're right, uh, the EQC scheme is confined to, or since the, since the early 1990s it has been confined to residential property only. Um, post loss, commercial, uh, commercial losses, um, generally speaking, um, commercial property owners were able to, to there, was a, there was a period when, when uh, insurers were Many insurers were not writing new business, um, bearing in mind that the earth was still shaking. You could say the house was still on fire. Um, but the market had settled down pretty quickly, and there were some new entrants to the New Zealand market that, um, that uh, picked up, um, well, introduced new product offerings for those who were unable to, temporarily unable to obtain cover from um, some traditional uh, providers. So that was particularly uh, owners of pre-1935 unreinforced masonry buildings in, um, in some of our centres. Um, but they are, the, the, price of, the, the price of insurance cover of course is much higher now than it was uh, previously, but there, I'm not aware of, um, of any uh, significant uh, withdrawal of terms or coverage, um, and certainly we have not experienced that in terms of our insurance protection. So I think it's uh, people are certainly paying more for for the for the cover, and it's given a new respectability to to mitigation in some cases because people can consider more explicitly the trade-offs in the cost of um, rising premiums versus the cost of investing in um, in some strengthening work or possibly. Uh, you know, moving to 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 to, to another side. Mr. Chair, the um, uh, I would say it's um, it's tomorrow morning in New Zealand as we sit here today, <laughs> and and to the guy who's had a few hours sleep over the last forty eight hours, uh, on behalf of the CA, uh, I would like to say thank you very much uh, to you for that outstanding presentation. Thank you, to the board, for your willingness to be here, for your great questions, and to members of the public. And I would. Turn it back over to you for any final questions or uh, or wrap up of the meeting. Just um, want to echo Glenn's comments. Thank you so much for for being here and spending some time with us, and um, look forward for our continued partnership with you. So.
with that, um, I think we'll bring it close to the special meeting. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.